Welcome to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. Folks, decades are arbitrary spans of history. They don't actually mark the start or end of anything, and almost nothing in reality fits neatly within the lines like that. However, the 70s are definitely and unequivocally the disco decade. Not only because disco was the 70s' biggest cultural trend, but also because the second the ball dropped on January 1st, 1980, disco was dead. And people knew it too, it wasn't a slow fade out. Disco was so over that it was instantly reduced to a punchline for years and years. The 80s would take a little while to figure out what it was going to be, but one thing was for sure, it wasn't going to be disco. Except. In the summer of 1980, one last straggler managed to creep over the line and hit it big. The final thumping dance floor anthem before MTV took over. Disco had one last breath of life in it after all, a breath of life called Funky Town. I want to take it to Funky Town. Yes, Funky Town by the band Litz Inc., which managed to outlast its own genre and become the final disco number one. And it did it through one really basic trick by being one of the most maddeningly catchy songs ever written. I think this would have been a hit at pretty much any time in the past 40 years. It's unstoppable. You only have to hear it once and you have every note immediately memorized. That's why it's had such longevity. No one's ever forgotten it. It wouldn't surprise me if in fact it never gets forgotten. The last man on earth, long after the fall of civilization and the entire concept of funk or towns and lost all meaning, that last guy will still be there humming that synth line to himself. Do, 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 do. I wish that food still existed. But one hit was obviously all it was going to be for Lips Inc. The fact that they had a hit at all was nothing short of a miracle. Like an 80s disco hit. The idea. The mind rebels at it. And yet, at the same time, the song was so unforgettable. Surely the band that created one of the all-time earworms had more tricks up their sleeve. What was their deal and how did they try to keep the party going long after the last dance? Well, let's talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. <sighs> let's talk about it. So, here is the story of Funky Town as told by the man who wrote it, band leader, composer, producer, Steven Greenberg. Take it away. Hey, first of all, tell me how you did Funky Town and, you know, and how well it was, uh, how come it became so acceptable all over the world? Well, uh, I was a songwriter, producer, and uh, wrote the song. Great story, bro. Tell it again. Okay, it looks like I'll have to tell the story. Okay, this guy is Steven Greenberg. He comes from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, I'm guessing he feels more comfortable in a recording studio than in front of a TV camera. But he's a pretty talented guy. He plays a ton of instruments, and he started a project in the late 70s he called Lips Inc. Get it? Lips Inc. He did eventually put a real band together, but mostly it was just him playing almost every instrument. And in 1979, he wrote the song that made him big. And uh, I wrote a song before that called Rocket. And... Uh... Hmm. Okay, well that seems important. Let's check that out first. It's all right. I do like that dun dun. It's got like this, this weird sound to it, like a like a video game sound effect. I like it. Took it to New York. Got turned down by every major record company in New York City. Took it to uh, Los Angeles. Got turned down by every major record company in Los Angeles. Well, that's a shame. I can only speculate why. Might be because. You know, it's not the greatest song ever written. But it's more likely because by mid-1979, disco was cratering. Like, people talk about disco demolition night, but a bunch of drunk idiots setting a ballpark on fire is not what killed disco. The disco backlash was a lot more widespread than that. And while it was all extremely ugly, the record industry deserves some blame for it, too. See, after Saturday Night Fever, the record industry went all in on disco. Every artist on earth was cutting dance tracks, and the market got oversaturated real quick. The sales started tanking, and the record industry panicked and pulled out. But Greenberg eventually found his way to what was basically the last disco label on earth, Casablanca Records, and they gave him a shot. He got signed, they released Rocket, it did nothing. He said, Steven, do you have more songs? I said, plenty. 
Don't worry about it. <laughs> didn't have one. <laughs> okay, well, he did write one eventually. He recruited a secretary and part-time singer, Cynthia Johnson, who also played a little saxophone for a band called Flight Time, later to be known as Morris Day and the Time. Get away from those losers. And Greenberg wrote a second song. And I thought, no way. No way. And Steven said, this is a hit. And I thought, he's out of his mind. Well, shows what you know, lady. 1980 is an absolutely bizarre year for the pop charts. Disco collapsed really suddenly. Like, it was still all over the charts in June 1979, and then completely gone by December. And no one had really figured out what to replace it with, so the entire industry took a massive slump. You look at the charts of 1980, there's no obvious trends, and almost none of the songs have stood the test of time, probably because they weren't that popular to begin with. So even after everyone everywhere proclaiming that disco was over and, you know, we'll kick your ass if you play it, yeah, there was definitely still an opening. Funky Town is, in its own way, a perfect song. It could not be a better version of itself. It has reached its final form. Whether disco is dead or not, this was a surefire hit. Name a song that crams this many hooks into three minutes. The most important hook, of course, is that synth line. Maybe the most instantly memorable musical phrase ever written. Name me a more immediately recognizable series of notes in history. Smoke on the water, twinkle twinkle little star, Beethoven's fifth. No, it's... Won't you take me down to fuck it down? But I also just really love how tight and simple it is. Most of the really shitty disco was slathered with strings and just really overproduced. Funky Town keeps things tight. It is very spare, electronic, and Greenberg says he was largely inspired by craft work of all things. It just brings a very economy of sound vibe to it. There is not a wasted note. Every instrument gets one perfect riff. One stab of strings, one brief sax solo. When the chorus finally kicks in with that sharp funk riff out of nowhere, I want to take it, to da -na -na, it all works. This is the song that put Minneapolis on the map. In fact, some people will try to tell you that the song is a tribute to Minneapolis. It is not. It's one of the greatest songs in Minnesota history. It's in the Minnesota Music Hall of Fame, but it's a song about how Minnesota sucks. This town was completely vanilla. <laughs> Minneapolis was not a funky town. It was overwhelmingly white, and in fact, it was one of the last places where the song caught on. There's only one major radio station in the Twin Cities that plays it, and that's KSTP-FM. Funky Town basically means I want to get out of here and go to New York. New York, of course, was the epicenter of disco. It's Saturday Night Fever, Studio 54. So I imagine if you're a kid from nowhere, NYC looks amazing. But I've lived in New York a while now, and uh, don't really recommend it. Can't really imagine it was any more attractive in 1980. It smelled funky, I'm sure, but eh. more than that, just it just makes me laugh to think about it. You know, I'm dreaming of going to New York to pursue a career in disco, which was completely gone by that point, so you could escape Minneapolis, which was about to blow the fuck up as the center of R&B in the 80s. The Twin Cities are without doubt the big, new, fertile music center of America. By the way, Prince was just starting out at that time, and according to people who knew him, it really chapped his ass that the biggest name in Minneapolis funk was some balding white guy. This other record from this young white kid just went number one on the black charts, on the urban charts. I don't know if Prince will ever cop to this, but I think that that served to propel him on to really do what he had to do. So there you have it. Prince became the biggest pop star in the world entirely to outdo Funky Town. Without Funky Town, maybe we don't have Purple Rain. Think about that. Of course, the other great hook of this song is Cynthia Johnson's vocals, who absolutely wails on this track. Speaking of lip sync, none of these people are Cynthia Johnson. And there's actually a second video for this. And that woman is definitely not Cynthia Johnson. I found a short promo clip that was clearly shot years later. Ah, uh, there, that actually is her. Even though, according to her website, this was meant to be a video for a completely different song. So, for as well-known and well-remembered and continuously played as this song has been for 40 years, 
Does it seem like not very many people actually like it? Okay, I think most people have some level of affection for it, but no one ever seems to call it a great song. It doesn't show up on any greatest hits of the 80s list or the disco retrospectives. I think the prevailing opinion is that it's catchy in the wrong ways. It's just a mindless, annoying novelty. I mean, take me to Funky Town. That's a ridiculous lyric. It's no wonder that this song going to number one did not revive disco. If anything, it probably cemented Disco's reputation as stupid music for stupid people. And even after Disco became cool again in the 90s, I think critics and historians feel like it showed up too late in the game to have any particular meaning attached to it. As much as I am in awe over the song, I don't think I'd call it one of my favorites either. But you know what? Screw it. I will make the case for Funky Town as a meaningful track. Most of Disco's reevaluation came from its importance to the black and gay communities, right? Well, you know... Maybe this isn't James Brown, but it's about the greatness of funk. About wanting to be around a crowd that listens to something other than Barry Manilow. And what's more evocative to the gay experience than wanting to get the fuck out of a nowhere town and go somewhere where there's an actual scene. But most important, have you checked out what other pop hits it was up against? Without Funky Town, all that would have been on the top 40 was shit like Ambrosia, Robbie Dupree, Jermaine Jackson, a billion other songs no one remembers. Thank God for Lips Inc. for making something that people would actually remember in that godforsaken year. Too bad they never had a chance of scoring a second hit. Lip Inc. only had that first hit because that song was unstoppable. Disco was still dead. Hitting number one was not enough to keep their own record label from shutting down all their East Coast offices. A second disco song on the charts in 1980, that was, uh, that was not gonna happen. Or was it? You know, I've been calling Funky Town the last disco hit because that's what I've always heard it called. It's just music nerd lore I've picked up. But I'm not sure it's actually true. The lines between disco and post-disco are blurry. A number of songs that came after were called disco, or would have been if disco hadn't become a dirty word. So the death of their genre is not entirely an excuse. Honestly, even if disco had been thriving, they'd probably still be one-hit wonders. Technically, their follow-up was releasing Rocket again, but that didn't really go anywhere for the second time. So you can consider their true follow-up this song. It's called Designer Music. I got brides in Atlanta. <laughs> No, not that designer. Designer music by Lips Inc. Okay, so this song is, um, bad. Whatever magic happened with Funky Town is not present. Every musical decision is wrong in the way that Funky Town is right. It's all herky-jerky, you can't dance to it, musically I have no idea what's going on. It certainly doesn't sound like a dance song. If you want to be charitable, it sounds more like one of the more avant-garde new wave acts, but honestly it's not even that. Whenever I check out flop singles for 80s artists that's topped out at like number 40, this is always what it sounds like. A whole bunch of annoying ideas that don't click and don't come together jammed into a giant mess. If this is designer music, I'd hate to find out what kind of mutant alien it was designed for. Actually though, I probably shouldn't say that because the song did find an audience. Designer music became a giant hit in Mexico and the Philippines. Greenberg kept going for a few years, but they never really sniffed the Hot 100 again. One of the many things that brought down disco was that it didn't have a lot of real superstars. I mean, they had their Bee Gees and their Donna Summer, but for the most part, disco was dominated by flash in the pan singers and faceless producers like Greenberg. That was already a problem in 1980, but it was devastating when MTV hit. You know, the era of Duran Duran, Wham, Prince, and this guy? No, he was not made for the 80s. Not really. Cynthia Johnson left the band after a couple albums. Lips Inc. kept going for a little bit more. I wish I could tell you there are more gems in their discography, but I listened and I didn't find a lot. Can't say I was surprised they did not have a hit with Tight Pair. Oh, or here's a surefire hit, Choir Practice. It's literally just a bunch of vocal exercises set to a dance beat. It's barely a song. 
Although they did have a minor dance floor hit with a cover of Aces How Long. Yeah, you know that one. Well, here's their version. This is actually pretty interesting. It's an extremely Kraftwerk sounding cover. Also, I like that they covered a one-hit wonder, just like fellow one-hit wonder Pseudo Echo wound up covering them. One-hit wonders supporting one-hit wonders. You'll love to see it. Cynthia Johnson did stay in music. She performs with the Grammy-winning gospel group Sounds of Blackness. And I would have sworn that Greenberg would turn out to be some kind of music lifer who stuck around behind the scenes, producing other great songs, but uh, it didn't happen for him. He stopped recording after 1985, and in fact, he never left Minneapolis, and uh, he went into web design, which, I mean, look at him, yeah. Mm, no. I think this guy used all his really good ideas on Funky Town. Like, even at Disco's height, Funky Town would have been a one-off. But really, Funky Town is the only hit you ever really need to make. That song is eternal. Greenberg has said it will outlive all his descendants, and he is correct. Funky Town will live forever. Maybe it's not a song you love, but it's one you have to respect. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'm about to go beat my skull with a hammer to try and remove this song from my brain.